A lot of it were, th- were through key drivers. I mean, things like uh, through the Climate Change Act, we've got quite stern sustainability drivers. There have been issues on a financial point of view, so when we had things like the global financial crisis, there were key financial aspects to it, and it was the need to try and actually use the resources we've got in a much more efficient and better way. Through case studies, through like the, the early kind of 2000s, we were seeing that you could save 15, 20% on the capital cost producing some of these buildings. So when you think about the amount of assets that we produce in the UK, construction is about £110 billion. So by being able to save you know, 20% of that would actually help to build a lot more assets and be really useful for what is an ever expanding population and other issues that we've currently got. Okay, so the, the agenda from the UK government really sort of started from the 2011 report. So the industry's had sort of five years already in terms of moving towards the, the level two requirements. The first thing was actually defining the definitions of what they meant by BIM. So there was the maturity levels which were predefined. The other thing that they did was they set up a BIM task group who had ownership of the requirements for BIM within the UK. Industry puts out a load of blockers to why BIM shouldn't be adopted. And there was a whole lot of work in terms of defining UK documentation and standards. So through publicly available specifications, PASIs for design construction, and then onto management and life cycle use, there's a whole series of standards that were created for that. Then supporting that, the Construction Industry Council then did various documentation to support in terms of dealing with professional indemnity and insurance, contracts and legal requirements. And then there was, a, again, a further set of documents supporting with templates and best practice to help sort of drive this whole thing. So by removing the blockers, the UK government has sort of helped the industry move forwards in terms of driving this whole agenda. There's, there's a, a complete mixture in terms of the responses to this. There are those who are still sort of saying it's not going to happen. There are those who have already been doing it for some time. What has changed is the perception by the industry in terms of what the blockers are. Whereas before it was seen to be things like cost of software, you know, now that it's a mandatory requirement that they've got to do it, those conversations have stopped, the legal conversations have stopped, the liability conversations have stopped. It's now back to how we do it. And the, the main issue is getting information from the employers. So it's the employers and clients who are the keys to basically getting on early, making sure they understand what they require from the BIM process and how they're going to drive the design teams and the construction teams forward to delivering the information that they're going to need for the life cycle use of the buildings. Well, it's been very interesting in the sense that for probably the last 115 years or so, we've been consistently saying in the UK that there have been issues in the industry. Uh, we've been underperforming in the terms of how we're trying to meet our key benchmarks. There have been issues in terms of lack of integration and very kind of antagonistic ways we've been doing things. So we actually haven't really changed that much. It wasn't until we had a driver from a client, the idea that central government was saying, if you don't do BIM, you won't get work from us through doing the mandate, that people stopped and started to listen because it was actually an effect whether they get work or not. It's been very positive. Um, we've had a number of sessions now. This is, uh, we've completed three. We've got one more session to go. So we've had about 90 people involved so far. And genuinely, people have been very kind of happy, positive, and we've had really lively discussions. Uh, a lot of talk about what's going on here. And we've been trying to convey that the UK has got a solution, not the solution. It's important to look at it from an objective way. And particularly when we talked about this idea of, you know, for the last 100 years, we've not been doing things very well. It's about learning from our mistakes to try and pick out the good bits that we've done and the good work in other nations as well to try and pick what's best for New Zealand. There are particular clients who have already looked look at uh, are doing this. You also had design and construction teams who are starting to drive their particular clients in terms of pushing the performance 
the, you know, the capabilities that are available through BIM. So you've got some sort of centres of excellence in terms of specific teams, groups of consultants working with contractors, trying to push clients down this route. You've got obviously the New Zealand BIM Handbook, which takes on a lot of the best practice from other guidance documents that's been developed around the world. So as a general framework, you know, there's been a lot of good work already carried out. From the discussions we've had with people attending the courses, some of the detailed elements need to be picked up in New Zealand and taken on and developed further. Some of the knowledge from projects that are being undertaken needs to be sort of transferred and, and added to in terms of where you are at the moment. So still a, a bit of work to do. There's the work within the ISO, which is basically pushing that overall agenda. And the general conception is that New Zealand will take on the ISO and work with that when it's finally published. And then it's feeding in the other elements that then need to be localised and then dealt with at project levels, which are going to help the whole sort of process bring together. Well, from the outset of it, obviously government has been a big push in terms of what's going on as a key client. But what we've been finding in the UK is that a number of private clients are now actually looking at it and asking for BIM as a kind of recommendation on how they want to act. They see it as a positive, they've seen the case studies, they've seen the savings that government can get and they're interested in getting it themselves. Particularly as a number of clients uh, who are private and serial clients, they want to be able to maintain and manage their information throughout the life cycle of their portfolio of assets and they see BIM as a great way of collecting this information and doing it. And particularly when you have these case studies that identify savings, better management, uh, less defects on site and other aspects, it seems to be positives for everyone involved. So these clients are really kind of latching on either through their own cloud or through design teams who are actually asking them to do BIM because it will help everyone out through the whole scheme. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, back home, about 99% of organisations we have in the UK are small or medium enterprises. So when all this was kind of written out in the UK, a key thing was to make sure that they'd be involved as part of the process. I mean, the kind of initiatives we did was that the, the government has paid for the licensing for a lot of the standards as part of the process. So they wouldn't be like a pay block to, to, to download and purchase these standards to adopt. So very much those kind of smaller players have been kept in mind as part of all the developments. In for something like housing, um, being able to replicate through standard units and things like that, having a formal system of capturing that information would obviously be of benefit. And we are seeing back home that a lot of housing developers are looking at BIM and utilising it not just from the asset point of view, but being able to visualise and present the design options, or even to have a kind of a revolving kit of parts where you can select options for the kitchen layouts and other aspects and supplement them as part of the process. We're really looking at sort of full life cycle information. So it's moving it from just dealing with the initial design. At the moment, a lot of it is just basically design companies taking it on, and then maybe moving it into the construction side. But really, the, the benefits of our full life cycle data in terms of the information moving across. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of internationally defining standards. Mm -hmm. So Building Smart International is using some called IFC industry foundation classes, which are definite sections of BIM objects. There's been a lot of work done within buildings that needs to stretch to other areas such as infrastructure, etc. So basically broaden the range. It's then looking at this whole sort of internet of things type approach where information can be exchanged from the graphical to the non-graphical via web services so we can have model information on models, regulatory checking, best practice, information can be given to both designers, constructors and facility management in terms of best methodology in terms of holding this information together. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the processes, again still more work that needs to be done on the standards and the methods of exchanging information. And then it's then looking at what the benefits of using those all can be to the various industries involved within that. I think it's been really positive what's going on around here. Um, 
a lot of the right questions have been asked. A lot of it is about the process, which has been really great. Uh, we've seen in a lot of places, not just in the UK, but internationally, a lot of the talk has been about the technology and the software, where a lot of the concerns that seem to be here is about process. And a consistent thing we've been hearing about is this need for common language. Uh, one thing that's been great about the, the New Zealand BIM handbook is that it has defined terminologies and things in it. So it's been a really good tool to start that common language part of the process. And it's been good to see that people are asking the right questions and involving uh, members from your professional institutes and other things like that. And through the BIM Acceleration Committee, it seems to be a really good way of actually focusing a single message through a single organisation filter it into the institutes so that everyone is talking through the same language and ultimately doing this journey together. I think one of the key aspects for me is that New Zealand again is typical of what's going on in the UK is there's various people down at different stages within this journey. So you've still got the people who are right at the beginning trying to work out how they can take this on and move it and drive it and yet you've got others who are basically moving on to the you know, quite high end levels and then looking at what they can do with the information to sort of inform the process. And it's basically it's trying to sort of narrow the gap between those who are just starting to sort of get on this BIM ladder and those that have learned the lessons and have gone through those processes and how you can basically take that learning back to help everybody else sort of move along that journey.